Section 13 of Old Greek Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Old Greek Stories by James Baldwin. Section 13 The Adventures of Theseus. Part 1 Aegeus and Aethra. There was once a king of Athens whose name was Aegeus. He had no son, but he had fifty nephews, and they were waiting for him to die so that one of them might be king in his stead. They were wild, worthless fellows, and the people of Athens looked forward with dread to the day when the city should be in their power. Yet so long as Aegeus lived they could not do much harm but were content to spend their time in eating and drinking at the king's table and in quarrelling among themselves. It so happened one summer that Aegeus left his kingdom in the care of the elders of the city, and went on a voyage across the Saronic Sea to the old and famous city of Troezen, which lay nestled at the foot of the mountains on the opposite shore. Troezen was not fifty miles by water from Athens, and the purple-peaked island of Aegina lay between them. But to the people of that early time the distance seemed very great, and it was not often that ships passed from one place to the other. And as for going by land round the great bend of the sea, that was a thing so fraught with danger that no man had ever dared try it. King Pythias of Troezen was right glad to see Aegeus, for they had been boys together, and he welcomed him to his city and did all that he could to make his visit a pleasant one. So, day after day, there was feasting and merriment and music in the marble halls of old Troezen, and the two kings spent many a happy hour in talking of the deeds of their youth and of the mighty heroes whom both had known. And when the time came for the ship to sail back to Athens, Aegeus was not ready to go. He said he would stay yet a little longer in Troezen, for that the elders of the city would manage things well at home, and so the ship returned without him. But Aegeus tarried not so much for the rest and enjoyment which he was having in the home of his old friend, as for the sake of Aethra, his old friend's daughter. For Aethra was as fair as a summer morning, and she was the joy and pride of Troezen, and Aegeus was never so happy as when in her presence. So it happened that some time after the ship had sailed, there was a wedding in the halls of King Pythias. But it was kept a secret, for Aegeus feared that his nephews, if they heard of it, would be very angry and would send men to Troezen to do him harm. Month after month passed by, and still Aegeus lingered with his bride, and trusted his elders to see to the affairs of Athens. Then one morning, when the gardens of Troezen were full of roses, and the heather was green on the hills, a babe was born to Aethra, a boy with a fair face and strong arms and eyes as sharp and as bright as the mountain eagles. And now Aegeus was more loath to return home than he had been before, and he went up on the mountain which overlooks Troezen, and prayed to Athena, the queen of the air, to give him wisdom and show him what to do. Even while he prayed, there came a ship into the harbor, bringing a letter to Aegeus and alarming news from Athens. "'Come home without delay,' these were the words of the letter which the elders had sent. "'Come home quickly, or Athens will be lost.' A great king from beyond the sea, Minos of Crete, is on the way with ships and a host of fighting men, and he declares that he will carry sword and fire within our walls, and will slay our young men, and make our children his slaves. Come and save us! It is the call of duty, said Aegeus, and with a heavy heart he made ready to go at once across the sea to the help of his people but he could not take Aethra and her babe, for fear of his lawless nephews, who would have slain them both. Best of wives, he said, when the hour for parting had come, listen to me, for I shall never see your father's halls, nor dear old Troezen, 
nor perhaps your own fair face again. Do you remember the old plane tree which stands on the mountainside, and the great flat stone which lies a little way beyond it, and which no man but myself has ever been able to lift? Under that stone I have hidden my sword and the sandals which I brought from Athens. There they shall lie until our child is strong enough to lift the stone and take them for his own. Care for him, Aethra, until that time. And then, and not till then, you may tell him of his father, and bid him seek me in Athens. Then Aegeus kissed his wife and the babe, and went on board the ship. The sailors shouted, the oars were dipped into the waves, the white sail was spread to the breeze, and Aethra from her palace window saw the vessel speed away over the blue waters towards Aegina and the distant Attic shore. Part Two, Sword and Sandals Year after year went by, and yet no word reached Aethra from her husband on the other side of the sea. Often and often she would climb the mountain above Troizen, and sit there all day, looking out over the blue waters and the purple hills of Aegina, to the dim distant shore beyond. Now and then she could see a white-winged ship sailing in the offing. But men said that it was a Cretan vessel, and very likely was filled with fierce Cretan warriors, bound upon some cruel errand of war. Then it was rumored that King Minos had seized upon all the ships of Athens, and had burned a part of the city, and had forced the people to pay him a most grievous tribute. But further than this there was no news. In the meanwhile Aethra's babe had grown to be a tall, ruddy-cheeked lad, strong as a mountain lion, and she had named him Theseus. On the day that he was fifteen years old he went with her up to the top of the mountain, and with her looked out over the sea. "'Ah, if only your father would come,' she sighed. "'My father,' said Theseus, "'who is my father, and why are you always watching and waiting and wishing that he would come? Tell me about him.' And she answered, "'My child,' Do you see the great flat stone which lies there half buried in the ground, and covered with moss and trailing ivy? Do you think you can lift it? I will try, mother, said Theseus, and he dug his fingers into the ground beside it, and grasped its uneven edges, and tugged and lifted and strained until his breath came hard, and his arms ached, and his body was covered with sweat but the stone was not moved at all. At last he said, The task is too hard for me until I have grown stronger. But why do you wish me to lift it? When you are strong enough to lift it, answered Aethra, I will tell you about your father. After that the boy went out every day and practiced at running and leaping and throwing and lifting and every day he rolled some stone out of its place. At first he could move only a little weight, and those who saw him laughed as he pulled and puffed and grew red in the face, but never gave up until he had lifted it. And little by little he grew stronger, and his muscles became like iron bands, and his limbs were like mighty levers for strength. Then, on his next birthday, he went up on the mountain with his mother, and again tried to lift the great stone, but it remained fast in its place and was not moved. "'I am not yet strong enough, mother,' he said. "'Have patience, my son,' said Aithra. So he went on again with his running and leaping and throwing and lifting, and he practiced wrestling also, and tamed the wild horses of the plain, and hunted the lions among the mountains, and his strength and swiftness and skill were the wonder of all men. And old Troizen was filled with tales of the deeds of the boy Theseus. 
yet when he tried again on his seventeenth birthday he could not move the great flat stone that lay near the plane tree on the mountain side. Have patience, my son, again said Ithra, but this time the tears were standing in her eyes. So he went back again to his exercising, and he learned to wield the sword and the battle axe, and to throw tremendous weights and to carry tremendous burdens. And men said that since the days of Hercules, there was never so great strength in one body. Then, when he was a year older, he climbed the mountain yet another time with his mother, and he stooped and took hold of the stone, and it yielded to his touch. And lo, when he had lifted it quite out of the ground, he found underneath it a sword of bronze and sandals of gold, and these he gave to his mother. "'Tell me now about my father,' he said. Ithra knew that the time had come for which she had waited so long, and she buckled the sword to his belt and fastened the sandals upon his feet. Then she told him who his father was, and why he had left them in Troizen, and how he had said that when the lad was strong enough to lift the great stone, he must take the sword and sandals and go and seek him in Athens. Theseus was glad when he heard this, and his proud eyes flashed with eagerness as he said, I am ready, mother, and I will set out for Athens this very day. Then they walked down the mountain together, and told King Pythias what had happened, and showed him the sword and the sandals. But the old man shook his head sadly, and tried to dissuade Theseus from going. "'How can you go to Athens in these lawless times?' he said. "'The sea is full of pirates. In fact, no ship from Troezen has sailed across the Saronic Sea since your kingly father went home to the help of his people eighteen years ago.' Then, finding that this only made Theseus the more determined, he said, But if you must go, I will have a new ship built for you, stanch and stout and fast sailing, and fifty of the bravest young men in Troezen shall go with you, and mayhap with fair winds and fearless hearts you shall escape the pirates and reach Athens in safety. Which is the most perilous way? asked Theseus. To go by ship, or to make the journey on foot round the great bend of land? The seaway is full enough of perils, said his grandfather, but the landway is beset with dangers tenfold greater. Even if there were good roads and no hindrances, the journey round the shore is a long one, and would require many days. But there are rugged mountains to climb, and wide marshes to cross, and dark forests to go through. There is hardly a footpath in all that wild region, nor any place to find rest or shelter, and the woods are full of wild beasts, and dreadful dragons lurk in the marshes, and many cruel robber giants dwell in the mountains. Well, said Theseus, if there are more perils by land than by sea, then I shall go by land, and I go at once. "'But you will at least take fifty young men, your companions, with you,' said King Pythias. "'Not one shall go with me,' said Theseus. And he stood up and played with his sword-hilt, and laughed at the thought of fear. Then, when there was nothing more to say, he kissed his mother and bade his grandfather good-bye, and went out of Troezen towards the trackless coastland which lay to the west and north. And with blessings and tears the king and Ithra followed him to the city gates, and watched him until his tall form was lost to sight among the trees which bordered the shore of the sea. Part three, Rough Roads and Robbers With a brave heart Theseus walked on, keeping the sea always upon his right. Soon the old city of Troezen was left far behind, and he came to the great marshes, where the ground sank under him at every step, and green pools of stagnant water lay on both sides of the narrow pathway. But no fiery dragon came out of the reeds to meet him, 
and so he walked on and on, till he came to the rugged mountain land, which bordered the western shore of the sea. Then he climbed one slope after another, until at last he stood on the summit of a grey peak from which he could see the whole country spread out around him. Then downward and onward he went again, but his way led him through dark mountain glens, and along the edges of mighty precipices, and underneath many a frowning cliff, until he came to a dreary wood where the trees grew tall and close together, and the light of the sun was seldom seen. In that forest there dwelt a robber giant, called Club Carrier, who was the terror of all the country. For oftentimes he would go down into the valleys where the shepherds fed their flocks, and would carry off not only sheep and lambs, but sometimes children and the men themselves. It was his custom to hide in the thickets of underbrush, close to a pathway, and when a traveller passed that way, leap out upon him and beat him to death. When he saw Theseus coming through the woods, he thought that he would have a rich prize, for he knew from the youth's dress and manner that he must be a prince. He lay on the ground where leaves of ivy and tall grass screened him from view, and held his great iron club ready to strike. But Theseus had sharp eyes and quick ears, and neither beast nor robber giant could have taken him by surprise. When Club Carrier leaped out of his hiding place to strike him down, the young man dodged aside so quickly that the heavy club struck the ground behind him, and then, before the robber giant could raise it for a second stroke, Theseus seized the fellow's legs and tripped him up. Club Carrier roared loudly and tried to strike again, but Theseus wrenched the club out of his hands and then dealt him such a blow on the head that he never again harmed travellers passing through the forest. Then the youth went on his way, carrying the huge club on his shoulder and singing a song of victory, and looking sharply around him for any other foes that might be lurking among the trees. Just over the ridge of the next mountain he met an old man who warned him not to go any farther. He said that close by a grove of pine trees, which he would soon pass on his way down the slope, there dwelt a robber named Sinus, who was very cruel to strangers. He is called Pine Bender, said the old man, for when he has caught a traveller, he bends two tall, lithe pine trees to the ground, and binds his captive to them, a hand and a foot to the top of one, and a hand and a foot to the top of the other. Then he lets the trees fly up, and he roars with laughter when he sees the traveller's body torn in sunder. "'It seems to me,' said Theseus, "'that it is full time to rid the world of such a monster.' And he thanked the kind man who had warmed him, and hastened onward, whistling merrily as he went down toward the grove of pines. Soon he came in sight of the robber's house built near the foot of a jutting cliff. Behind it was a rocky gorge and a roaring mountain stream. In front of it was a garden wherein grew all kinds of rare plants and beautiful flowers. But the tops of the pine trees below it were laden with the bones of unlucky travellers, which hung bleaching white in the sun and wind. On a stone by the roadside sat Sinus himself, and when he saw Theseus coming, he ran to meet him, twirling a long rope in his hands and crying out, "'Welcome, welcome, dear prince! Welcome to our inn, the true traveller's rest!' "'What kind of entertainment have you?' asked Theseus. "'Have you a pine-tree bent down to the ground and ready for me?' "'Ay, two of them,' said the robber. "'I knew that you were coming, and I bent two of them for you.' As he spoke, he threw his rope towards Theseus, and tried to entangle him in its coils. But the young man leaped aside, and when the robber rushed upon him he dodged beneath his hands, and seized his legs, as he had seized club carriers, and threw him heavily to the ground. Then the two wrestled together among the trees, but not long, for Sinus was no match for his lithe young foe. 
and Theseus knelt upon the robber's back as he lay prone among the leaves, and tied him with his own cord to the two pine trees which were already bent down. "'As you would have done unto me, so will I do unto you,' he said. Then Pinebender wept and prayed, and made many a fair promise, but Theseus would not hear him. He turned away, the trees sprang up, and the robber's body was left dangling from their branches. Now this old pine-vendor had a daughter named Perigune, who was no more like him than a fair and tender violet is like the gnarled old oak at whose feet it nestles. And it was she who cared for the flowers and the rare plants which grew in the garden by the robber's house. When she saw how Theseus had dealt with her father, she was afraid, and ran to hide herself from him. "'Oh, save me, dear plants!' she cried, for she often talked to the flowers as though they could understand her. "'Dear plants, save me, and I will never pluck your leaves, nor harm you in any way so long as I live.' There was one of the plants which up to that time had had no leaves, but came up out of the ground looking like a mere club or stick. This plant took pity on the maiden. It began at once to send out long feathery branches with delicate green leaves, which grew so fast that Perigune was soon hidden from sight beneath them. Theseus knew that she must be somewhere in the garden, but he could not find her, so well did the feathery branches conceal her. So he called to her. Perigune, he said, you need not fear me, for I know that you are gentle and good, and it is only against things dark and cruel that I lift up my hand. The maiden peeped from her hiding-place, and when she saw the fair face of the youth and heard his kind voice, she came out, trembling, and talked with him. And Theseus rested that evening in her house, and she picked some of her choicest flowers for him and gave him food. But when in the morning the dawn began to appear in the east, and the stars grew dim above the mountain peaks, he bade her farewell and journeyed onward over the hills. And Perigune tended her plants and watched her flowers in the lone garden, in the midst of the piney grove. But she never plucked the stalks of asparagus, nor used them for food, and when she afterwards became the wife of a hero, and had children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, she taught them all to spare the plant which had taken pity upon her in her need. The road which Theseus followed now led him closer to the shore, and by the by he came to a place where the mountains seemed to rise sheer out of the sea, and there was only a narrow path high up along the side of the cliff. Far down beneath his feet he could hear the waves dashing evermore against the rocky wall, while above him the mountain eagles circled and screamed, and grey crags and barren peaks glistened in the sunlight. But Theseus went on fearlessly, and came at last to a place where a spring of clear water bubbled out from a cleft in the rock, and there the path was narrower still, and the low doorway of a cavern opened out upon it. Close by the spring sat a red-faced giant, with a huge club across his knees, guarding the road so that no one could pass, and in the sea at the foot of the cliff basked a huge turtle, its leaden eyes looking always upward for its food. Theseus knew, for Perigune had told him, that this was the dwelling place of a robber named Skyron, who was the terror of all the coast, and whose custom it was to make strangers wash his feet so that while they were doing so he might kick them over the cliff to be eaten by his pet turtle below. When Theseus came up, the robber raised his club and said fiercely, No man can pass here until he has washed my feet. Come, set to work. Then Theseus smiled and said, Is your turtle hungry to-day, and do you want me to feed him? The robber's eyes flashed fire, and he said, you shall feed him, but you shall wash my feet first. And with that he brandished his club in the air and rushed forward to strike. But Theseus was ready for him. With the iron club which he had taken from club-carrier in the forest, he met the blow midway, 
and the robber's weapon was knocked out of his hands and sent spinning away over the edge of the cliff. Then Sciron, black with rage, tried to grapple with him. But Theseus was too quick for that. He dropped his club and seized Sciron by the throat. He pushed him back against the ledge on which he had been sitting. He threw him sprawling upon the sharp rocks, and held him there, hanging halfway over the cliff. "'Enough! Enough!' cried the robber. "'Let me up, and you may pass on your way.' "'It is not enough,' said Theseus, and he drew his sword and sat down by the side of the spring. "'You must wash my feet now. Come, set to work.' Then Sciron, white with fear, washed his feet. And now, said Theseus, when the task was ended, as you have done unto others, so will I do unto you. There was a scream in mid-air which the mountain eagles answered from above. There was a great splashing in the water below, and the turtle fled in terror from its lurking place. Then the sea cried out, I will have naught to do with so vile a wretch and a great wave cast the body of Sciron out upon the shore. But it had no sooner touched the ground than the land cried out, I will have naught to do with so vile a wretch. And there was a sudden earthquake, and the body of Sciron was thrown back into the sea. Then the sea waxed furious, a raging storm arose, the waters were lashed into foam, and the waves with one mighty effort threw the detested body high into the air. And there it would have hung unto this day, had not the air itself disdained to give it lodging, and changed it into a huge black rock. And this rock, which men say is the body of Sciron, may still be seen, grim, ugly, and desolate. And one-third of it lies in the sea, one-third is embedded in the sandy shore, and one-third is exposed to the air. End of section 13